perhaps it's even practical to run it on a large data set. So this motivation seemed very appealing, compelling to us, and we decided to design such a model. So the idea that we came up with is extremely simple. We simply said the model shall be a one-dimensional convolution, which we apply, which we repeatedly apply very many times. So this is the cohort. So unlike other memory models that you may have seen before, this one is particularly simple. You have an input, and you apply a one-dimensional convolution at every location, and then you just keep applying it until you produce the output. That is the whole model. Now this model has so when we, one of the key properties that we would like from neural networks that that try to learn algorithms is that they should be able to generalize to large problem instances from small problem instances. This model has a chance of doing so because the convolutional operation naturally extends to longer instances. And if you increase the depth appropriately, the model will have a chance to perform the operation that the amount, perform the necessary computation that the, the computation that are necessary for the right. And of course, it also has a nice property that one-dimensional convolutions can be implemented extremely quickly. So now let's mention some of the details of this model. The model is really a GRU through depth. We did not use a neural network. That's, we did not use quite a neural network here. Instead, we used an LSTM, a GRU structure through depth, in order to make it easier to train re the really deep models that we use. It could also have been an LSTM, and the choice was completely arbitrary. Now, there are some important details, and this particular detail is worth mentioning. For the harder problems that we try, we, during training, we use different weights at each layer. So, specifically, we would use we used six sets of weights, where we would cycle through the weights at each layer. So we would say, in layer one, we use weights one, and then in layer two, we use weights two, and so on, until we get to layer six. And then in layer seven, we use weight one again. So this way, you have more parameters, and that increased the dimensionality of our model, which made training easier. But as a result, we were able to optimize the problem of the optimization. But then, so the optimization become easier. And then over time, we would add a cost function that gradually pushed all the base matrices together. And that made learning work. Without this, we would not be able to solve this problem. So we also found that dropout, using dropout and adding noise to the gradient and gradient clipping were all very important to get the good results. And unfortunately, as it is often the case with these models, very careful hyperparameter optimization was necessary. So in, the, in, the, in our experiment, we used models where the depth was equal to the fix. And the model could do, which means that the model could do quadratic amounts of computation, even though its depth is always is on the end. So the results that we got are reasonably nice. We trained the model on short instances of the problem, and we tested it on the long instances of the problem. In all cases, we trained the model on instances of up to length 20 using curriculum level, and then we tested it on instances of up to length 2000. The, problem, the input representation was given as in the following examples. For the famous task of binary addition, we, used, we would simply concatenate the numbers, one after the other, and same for binary multiplication. The other tasks, such as to reverse a sequence or to count a number of bits, etc., they were also represent, they were represented in the natural way. The results were reasonably good. We found, we found that by carefully optimizing the hyperparameters, we were able to obtain models that made no errors whatsoever on instances of up to length 2000. So that is very nice. In particular, we were able to train models on multiplication. And this is something which has never, which as far as I know, has not been done before with neural models. The reason we were able to do it is because even though multiplication algorithm requires a very large number of steps, the parallelism of our model made it possible for us to train it with gradient and back propagation because we were able to use a shallower model than would have been required. So 
we feel that this model should be should be what what the reason we are excited about this model is because we feel that it should because we feel that you can push a lot of data to it, and that means that it will be feasible to apply to large data sets such as machine translation, which is less what you want. So now at this point, I would like to take a small pause to show you a video of the neuro of the neural GPU in action. I think the videos are quite cool. Let me just explain to you what you will see. So at every frame of the video, you will see a layer. So you see this right here, you have this one dimensional convolution followed by layer, and you have layers of them. So as you see with the video, in the video, you will see the different, every frame will correspond to a time step, to, to, a layer, to the complete state of the layer. And even though the convolution is one dimensional, because we use multiple filters, the image will look, will, will appear to be two dimensional. So let me show it to you now. Okay. So you clump the inputs in the form of vectors, and then, you, and then the model starts running. And remember, at every, at, every, at every frame of the video, you see a different layer of the neural GPU. And it become, when you look at these videos, it becomes clear that the neural GPU is actually a differentiable cellular automaton. Mm -hmm. You can see that in this case, the goal was to copy the vectors at the top down to the vectors at the bottom. But that's not quite correct. That's not quite what's going on. Because each vector is a representation, is, is, a, is actually a vector representation of, of, of the bit, zero or one. And so it is okay for the model to be slightly imprecise, as long as the correct bit can be still recovered from the final value. You can also imagine how this process would simply work if you had a longer input and you gave the model more time to run for it. Here's another task where you have a sequence of bits which are represented as vectors, which is why you only see two vectors, by the way, zero or one. And now if you pay attention, you will see that some columns are going up while some columns are going down. And after some time, the process will converge where the, where the bit vectors have all been reversed. And again, when we do care, when the, when the hyperparameter optimization is sufficiently careful, we are able to train mo to get models which make no errors whatsoever, even on inputs of length 2,000. And again, you can see that some columns are going up, some columns are going down, and it's really easy to see how this process can keep going on indefinitely if you had very long if you had very long inputs. So zeros and ones, the vectors are—it's hard to see them. But the point is, you see, so so pay, pay close attention now. Every row, you have only two, two different values of rows because there are only two symbols, zero or one. Now this is addition. You see the pattern here is kind of more complicated than funky, and it's a bit hard to understand what's going on, except that something is happening. It looks like you have a wave of computation, kind of. <laughs> and now the answer is produced. It's like it goes, it go, it collects all the data, and then it moves down by leaving a trace, by leaving the answer in the trace. Here's another example of addition, where you see kind of the wave spread up, and then something happens, and then the wave spread down. And now you see it spreads, it goes down and it leaves the answer, it leaves the answer behind. Sorry? Each line, so each line, yeah, so kind of time is this way, and the filters are done. And here's multiplication. So multiplication is quite a bit more complicated to understand. You will see more, less regular patterns, but it's still fun to look at it. You can clearly see that things are going on, although it's not exactly clear what they are. <laughs> but what's, what's interesting about it is that it works for multiplication. So you could take this model and give it 2,000 bit numbers Right, run this process for 2,000 sets, and it will produce the answer. Here's another example. So again, it looks like at this point, because of this multiplication is a more complicated task, task, it's harder to understand what exactly is going on. 
So that's the end of the video. And it also is the end of my talk. So the conclusion is, this is a model which is fast. It's kind of like, it, it's kind of an algorithmic model on the one hand. On the other hand, you can give it lots of NLP data and the model will be able to consume it. Thank you very much for your attention.